Well, good morning and uh, good afternoon, depending on where you're at. Uh, I want to thank you for joining this live stream. This is the first live stream I've done like this. And I'm really getting prepared to do a, a larger event uh, here sometime in the near future. So this is letting me set up my test. And I appreciate you being here to do that. We're going to talk about Tesla, Tesla service modes. Um, I have been very passionate about the Tesla stuff because we've got uh, I've got two Teslas now. We're now servicing some of those vehicles in our shop. And so we have a poll that's up right now. And so if you can hear me, I just want to get uh, some feedback from you. Can you let us know or answer that poll and uh, give us some feedback as to whether or not you're performing any of these uh, or services on these vehicles? And then a couple of housekeeping notes here. So we do have a chat panel. We also have a Q&A panel that we're going to launch uh, here in just a second. So if you have any questions along the way, go ahead and dump them in the Q&A segment. We'll have a Q&A segment at the end uh, so we can try to wrap up any questions that weren't answered. Um, and then uh, let's see, is there something else? I need to look at my uh, notes there. No, I think that's it. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so we're gonna talk about uh, some topics here. We're gonna talk about basic service mode, service mode plus. Uh, we're gonna go into some Tesla service information and uh, you should all be aware that Tesla service information now is free. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything, but if you do subscribe to the toolbox application, uh, you will need your login to get to that service information because it will have some other additional uh, data. Um, and so it'll be, uh, be beneficial. So let's go to the next slide here. So why do we want to use uh, service mode? Um, well, one, when the car comes into your shop, it's in this, uh, you're going to turn off the bi-directional stuff so that the consumer cannot uh, interact with the, with the vehicle and turn on things or turn off things. Uh, you don't want that actually happening. You also get to turn off the camera recording uh, so the customer can't go back to their log and see what's been going on inside the shop. And then um, you're also going to get to, you're going to want to uh, check the service settings. So you'll be able to enable uh, the vehicle speed limiter or disable the speed limiter. And then you're going to want to unlock the gateway and we're going to walk through those modes. Okay. So we're going to look here at service mode. Um, here we are. So here's our service mode page that we would typically see. And just let me explain my setup here. I do have a connection into a live vehicle. So I do have a rig where we'll be able to see exactly what's on my screen. And we'll walk through the, the various menus. But when you go into basic service mode, you can see up here it just says service mode. If you're in service mode plus, it will say service mode plus. Okay. And one of the first things that we're going to go into when we go into the service mode, we'll kind of walk through this panel here, but we want to look at the release notes here. Tesla has been really uh, looking at the aftermarket and making a lot of advancements and bringing a lot of tools to, uh, to us in the aftermarket. In fact, there are some tools here for the camera pitch uh, aim function, which needs to be carried out whenever you change out the windshield or change out the camera. You used to have to have the toolbox application, and it was kind of a tedious thing because you would actually have to request the, the car to take a picture of, a, of an image with the target out in front of the vehicle properly placed. And then you would see what those measurements are, and then you would go back and adjust and then repeat that process. Very, very time consuming, and a lot of times it didn't always work. So uh, Tesla just brought this right to us right on the screen here. It doesn't cost anything to get into this. So um, we'll, we'll walk through some of that. And then the service mode plus, if we look deeper into this, you're gonna see you've got some additional things that activate on that screen, including a can viewer here. And then uh, on the next screen here, you'll see also there's a new panel here for CAN bus. And we're gonna walk through that here in just a second. All right, so let's, let's go to our car here. And we're gonna hop right in here and go right into service mode, okay? And to do that, what we do is we hit the car icon here in the, in the lower left, and then you hit the software tab, 
And then where it says Model Y, just on that model, you're going to long press on that for about uh, five seconds or so. And then you're going to type in an access code in that service. And you hit enter. It's going to warn you. It says that you need to be a service professional so that we're not, you know, not causing any problems. So we're going to go ahead and enable. And one thing, one first thing to note is that if you're in a hot climate condition or a cold climate condition, um, it turns off the climate control system the moment you enter. So if it's super hot, you want to turn the air back on, you can just touch the temperature indicator down there at the bottom and that turns everything back on uh, for you. I'm going to actually just turn it off. Okay. So I mentioned the release notes. So we want to click through here. This is a really uh, good place for you to find out what Tesla has been adding um, and what things that you might want to go out and check and, uh, and explore. Um, so this is the latest, the one up at the top, but I'll go back down to the very bottom. You can see that uh, they started this. They, they put a new high voltage panel in, enhanced steering panel enhanced high voltage interlock loop panel, low voltage panel, uh, some Falcon door stuff, some steering column stuff, and then the camera clear and camera pitch stuff. And I do have a, um, I have a target out in front of this car, so we're gonna actually see that when we get to the uh, uh, driver assistance stuff. Uh, the, this update after that, you can explore that. And then um, the next one, you can see this new brakes panel, uh, pretty cool stuff for burnishing in the brakes. If you ever find yourself replacing brake pads, which, um, you know, in certain climates, you may actually have to do brake work. But uh, in most cases, these vehicles probably won't need uh, brake pads. And then there's the, uh, the last one. OK, so we can close out of this panel. We've got the VIN. We've got the mileage. We've got a little more info about the vehicle here. And then uh, down at the bottom here, bottom right, we have service settings, so this is where you would go in and you would remove your speed limiter so you can actually road test the car. Uh, you've got a touch check here that basically lets you check the screen. So you can do two fingers at a time, three. So if somebody's complaining that they you know, can't get the screen to uh, respond, uh, you can come in here and test that out. And then to get out of it, it says to tap the two corners on the display simultaneously. Any two corners, I think. All right. And so that brings you back and you'll see at the lower tray, we've got that big wrench uh, red icon here. So we click on that and that brings us back in there. If you touch the additional resources, it's telling you about the other information that you can get on Tesla or service.tesla.com. Um, complimentary service manuals, parts manuals, do it yourself stuff, uh, additional diagnostic software. So that's the toolbox stuff. We're going to explore that. And then it's talking about what else is available, and we're going to go through those here. Um, you've got service alerts. So if you click the service alerts, you're seeing right now I'm seeing a bunch of service alerts here. And you know when it says A, an A096 or an A, that means that's an alert. And then there's some that are W, so those are warnings. And if you scroll down here, you can see. Um, you see the little waveform at the end of the report there, and that means that there's a payload of data, additional um, alert information. And so in this one here, there's actually just one line there, BMS A170 limp mode active, uh, false, for whatever that code is. Uh, I'm going to go down to the bottom down here because there was a couple that I recall. Um, I said a bunch of alerts here, just messing with the car here. So this is uh, says one or more messages the vehicle controller receives periodically from the front row passenger optic, uh, occupancy classification, um, not received. And then there's some alert payload data there. So, and then you can go look at the customer, uh, what the customer facing um, alerts that they get. And then you can just look at all of the alerts uh, and go through them. So uh, one word of caution on the alerts is that uh, it's been my experience that you find a lot of alerts are false failures. And um, so beware. Uh, there, there may be some conditions here that you, you don't want to chase, uh, you know, chase something that, doesn't, that there is no fix for. And a lot of times there may be a software update that comes down the road to, to solve for that particular problem. Uh, we have a software reinstall panel. And 
you know, it's telling us basically don't use it when you're changing the car computer because that basic that module has basically all the software for all the other modules. So when you want to change out a module or you're replacing one, um, you can hit reinstall and it'll go out there and reinstall all the, all the software for the different modules. And then we have this brake burnishing um, option here, and it's also under the chassis uh, button as well, but this is pretty cool. This, and it's going to give us a warning here, um, the regen gets turned off because, of course, we, we want to disable regen so we can actually use the brakes to uh, slow the vehicle down. And this gives you a guided operation. And what it tells you that's going to happen here, it says you've got to select some road conditions that's going to allow you to, to accelerate up to 50 miles an hour and then back, back down to zero. Uh, and you need to do that for 10 times. But it will basically have you press the brake hard enough to hit the target range, which is 34 bar. So I'm going to press on the brake pedal right now, okay? And I'm going to start pressing down. You can see there's, there's my 34 bar. So there's about how hard I need to press on the brake. And it will actually give you some audible uh, prompts uh, to help you run this uh, operation. So we're going to go ahead and uh, back out of that, of course. And uh, okay, so now the next one we're going to go to is driver assistance. So in the driver assistance, we have cameras, and when we click on cameras, we are now seeing um, uh, over in the right there, we can see the fisheye pitch and the main pitch. So those are the, the continuous adaptive um, offsets that are being applied to that um, as we're driving down the road. If we want to touch on any of those cameras, we can see what they are. It says camera type is RGGB, so that's red, green, green, blue. Uh, the previous model, so this is a uh, what's called a hardware four vehicle, and it only has two cameras in the front. The previous uh, system, hardware three, actually has a triple camera, and the cameras are RCCB, so that the normally green channels are actually clear. And uh, so there's been a lot of computer science, uh, machine vision science around uh, you know these perception systems, so they're continuing to adapt, update cameras and uh, you know make sure that they're providing all the data for the vehicle over on that left panel here we see the ecu primary a and b uh, normal their statuses and then we've got uh, this when they're green icons you've, you're there everything's available and then below that we have sats uh, so this vehicle has been sitting inside the building for for a while so we currently don't have any satellites in in view uh, normally you'll see you know a, a number of you know nine or more sometimes 12 and then it will also have a green indicator next to dead reckoning now one word of caution here i have had uh, some different equipment in my car to collect data record data and i've actually had some situations where um, it has affected that satellite accuracy and gotten warnings on that and i'll, I'll probably do a video on that in the future to uh, kind of highlight what's going on there but this is one area to go check. Um, what I found was that when I was having that interference problem, I went to look at this satellite stuff. Everything was green, but it only showed like one satellite in use when the car is you know, out in the open. So that was a clue that there was something going on with the uh, system. Unplugging my equipment, removing it from the car, actually it re-enabled all that, uh, that data. Um, and then, uh, so you can ping the, the system to kind of wake it up. You can reset it. You can clear the camera calibration, and then it's going to cause, uh, cause you to take the car out and drive it. And then we can go here to camera preview. All right, so I'm going to touch that. It's giving us a warning that there's nothing here being recorded, but, of course, we are recording. Okay. Um, and so the first thing we're looking at is actually this main uh, screen. And that's the main camera. This is the wide camera, okay, wide camera look. Uh, so in-service information that tells you to set up that target. Some of you that have been doing uh, targeting uh, camera calibration may recognize that target. That is, yes, the Hyundai Kia target. This is the one that's also used for Tesla, but it's not used for any type of adaptation from the cameras, just to look at the measurement and see where this uh, these, these lines are. And you see that piece of tape there that I've got added to the, the target, it's just above the blue line. 
um, that's supposed to line up, the top of that edge is supposed to line up with that, that blue line. So really the camera is, it looks like it's pitched down a little bit, but service information says if that falls in between these two green lines, you're okay. If I go to the wide view, uh, same thing, we're, we're okay on that one, okay? We can also look at the different panel. So I've, I've got the, uh, this is a left door pillar. So this is on the B pillar looking left forward. So you can kind of see my setup here and my, my helper Johnny over there that's helping us um, um, do this show here. Uh, we're looking at the left uh, repeater. So this is what you would see when you're hitting the turn signal. There's the right door pillar and then the right fender. Okay, and then you scroll over, you can look at the rear view as well. All right. So we're going to go to the next panel down here. And do we have any questions that have uh, popped in here yet? Yeah, Wayne wants to know if the customer has bi-directional data while the vehicle is being serviced. Uh, say that one more time. I, I didn't quite hear that. Wayne, he wants to know if the customer has bi-directional data while the vehicle is being serviced. So this is why you want to put it into, to, uh, into service mode, okay? And when you put it into service mode, they, do, they no longer have access to the, uh, the info. And I'm, I'm, we're actually starting the Q&A now, so you can go ahead and add your stuff in there. Um, so hopefully that, that answers your question. Um, okay. So yeah, you don't want the customer doing anything. And also they can look at the live preview um, on the camera. Uh, they can pull up the live preview for you. Uh, so they can pull up their phone. They can actually look at some of the camera inputs while the car's in your shop. So you definitely want to turn that off, you know, unless you want them to see that. But uh, you normally want that off. That way they can't turn on the air conditioning system or turn on the seat heaters, roll the windows down, that kind of stuff. So you. You want to disconnect them. Okay, so well, let's go back in the car here and uh, take a look at the infotainment here. We're going to hit connectivity, and it's showing us some, you know, the Wi-Fi status, Tesla connection, um, the antenna information, and all that. And you've got a couple of test options down at the bottom. We've got software uh, information here, so you've got infotainment. And there's two banks of data. So you can see there's two gigabytes in each of those banks. Uh, it shows you what version it is, shows you if there's any failure counts that are excessive and whether or not there's a staged update um, and any other failures over here on the right on the autopilot system. And then also on the map, uh, map data. So you can get the uh, information on that. And then down in the lower right, we do have EC ECU update status. And that is mentioned in the release notes. Um, on um, some of the updates that have come in. So you can see the last uh, firmware job, uh, what that version number was, the ECUs that were actually updated, and then version matched ECU down at the bottom here, we have 63, and if we click on that, it will uh, show you all the different modules that have matching software, okay? So everything, uh, everything looks good there. Uh, next, we're gonna go to the charging um, tab. So this is somewhere where you can Maybe as you're plugging the car into a charger and you want to check some of the data uh, from the charger, uh, this will help you do some uh, diagnosis on that. Uh, the HV charging information, um, the state state of charge, uh, the HVIL, um, and the pyro fuse. And then below that, you see there's a battery health. You can run a health check on these systems, but it will take you 24 hours. And this will tell you, it'll prompt you to set the car up. And it basically says that uh, they want the vehicle plugged into a charger that can do greater than six kilowatts uh, on, on AC, okay? And that the state of charge is less than 50%, okay? And then you're gonna turn off all of the summon sentry mode um, and automatic uh, preconditioning take, you're gonna turn all that off. And then you, you, the car's gonna need to sit. And what it will do, it'll drain that battery down and then it will charge it back up and, uh, and it's looking for information, you know, and it's gonna give us a, a status um, of, of health. So this car is fairly new. I haven't run this test yet. So uh, you can see the contactor state and then the DC link um, there. 
We can look deeper at the battery itself. You can see that the battery currently is, we're at 29%. Also has some shipping information down here uh, to let you know that ground sheet C shipping is okay right now. And that uh, you would have to actually bring it down below 28% state of charge if you're gonna return this via air. So, you know, if you're in a mode where you're gonna need to replace that, uh, replace the battery, you need to be aware of this before you get it out of the vehicle. Uh, and then there's also a note up here, uh, it says tap on components to view more information. So you can tap on these little items here. So that's the fast charge contactors. Over here, there's the positive contactor. Um, these, this is another panel that just popped up. You can ping different modules and, and also run a test, right? So you've got the, this uh, test, HVP PCS interface test. Um, and let's see what else negative contactor all right and then this is the hvil um it gives you some data about uh, that system and you can actually run a test okay so here's our low voltage panel and we've got power distribution and you can see uh, vc front information you can reset the vc front so that's a vehicle controller front um, the lithium ion battery information uh, the power conversion system uh, data over here on the right and you can see the, the type of battery we have as a this is the lithium-ion battery uh, set up in this particular vehicle and then this is your home link so a lot of these cars don't come with home link nowadays and you've got to add that in and uh, for this one I did buy a, the actual home link retrofit kit and installed it myself the wiring harness and everything was all in place you had to put a couple bolts in mount it and then you run the retrofit uh, button there and it basically deploys the the data through the network and I believe this is just on a LIN LIN system so I was able to update the data and then I went back and married it to the to activate it uh, at my house all right um, the next one we're going to go into is the thermal okay and before we go there I want to talk a little bit about thermal management okay so if you look at our slide here um, and we'll go full screen on this, Johnny. Uh, the thermal management system on these vehicles are pretty complex. And you know we have to be able to manage uh, temperatures. And Tesla now has a pretty sophisticated system. And there's lots of learning opportunities here uh, to uh, um, you know, go through these systems. And, and I play with this all the time so I can get more familiar with what's, uh, what's happening with these systems. So if we go to this panel here, you'll see that we have the, what's called the octo valve up here. That device can actually put this cooling system into multiple configurations. And on the left here, we have the series, series radiator bypass mode. Um, so you can see the radiator is actually out of the loop up here. See, there's nothing going to it. And the entire system is in the same loop. We have both pumps uh, going here, the, the powertrain pump, the battery pump there running at 6,000 uh, RPM and our flow rate here, you see there's 20 liters per minute. So it's moving quite a bit of coolant pretty quickly through the system. Uh, the one in the center there, we're running in what's called a parallel mode. So these two loops are isolated from each other. And you can see the one on the left is actually going through the radiator out front. And that has your powertrain loop, uh, rear drive unit, front drive inverter. And then over on the right, we have the high voltage battery and the autopilot. And you can see we're running at seven liters per minute there. Over here on this side, we're at six liters per minute. And we are also going through the chiller, which we'll talk about refrigeration system here in just a second. And then over here on the right, we have uh, what's called series mode. Um, so we're actually going through the radiator. So we just added, we, instead of bypassing the radiator, we now have the radiator in uh, play. Uh, the next, there's one other one here. This is called ambient source. And if we look at this particular one, you'll see that we're, we're flowing through the radiator, through the chiller, and you know, so that's like by itself. And I'll explain this a little bit further here in just a second. The other side here is just, it's, it's running through the entire powertrain loop and the battery loop. So what do you think is going on here? It's prepping this system for operation. Um, 
And so this next screen here I'm going to turn on. This, we'll take a deeper look here. I'll go ahead and zoom into that there, Johnny. Okay. So there is a chiller here that's part of the refrigeration loop. And if we look right here, we can see that this chiller is actually active. Okay. And we are running uh, refrigerant. That's like a, an evaporator that's, you know, getting very cold. Well, we've got coolant that's running on the other side of that. So we're transferring or we're taking that heat from the coolant and moving it into the refrigerant. Okay. And so what it's doing is it's prepping that loop so that it can be ready for managing uh, elevated battery uh, temperatures that may be happening due to supercharging. And I have seen this actually happen. Uh, back on our thermal management uh, over here, you can see that um, we've got these a series of solenoids or valves here. And we'll be able to click on each of these and, and discover which ones they are as far as identification goes. But you can see that it can open and close to route refrigerant. If we look up here in the top, there is nothing going here into the vehicle. So you have cabin condensers for heat and we have cabin evaporator. Those circuits are actually shut off. So this thermal management system in this mode right now is only used, it's only being used for managing the, um, the loops here for the powertrain system. All right, so let's go back into the vehicle here for a second. And we'll jump in uh, up at the top here. We do have actions and you can see system status is at the top. Coolant not ready for drain refill, refrigerant not ready for drain refill. So why do you think that is? Well, we need to tell that vehicle that we're going to perform that service so that it can open up systems and make sure that we can drain all the coolant out of it. Same goes with the refrigeration. If we don't have all the valves open, uh, and we go to recover, you know, we may recover, it may pull it down into a vacuum, but when we go to disconnect certain things, we may discover, have a bad discovery or a bad uh, incident because we had refrigerant trapped in those areas. Uh, you've got a couple of other items here. Uh, you've got run coolant pump identification, and then you can run some performance tests on the air conditioning system. So this is a service you could run periodically for your customers' cars, uh, and, and it'll actually spit out a report for you. So go back to our thermal pad, uh, page. We can now look at our refrigeration system. And here, the refrigeration system is off. I'm gonna click on each of these, um, these little items here. They're the little circles there. You've got discharge sensor. Uh, the first one I had was the suction sensor. And there's our suction temperature and pressure up at the top there, top left. Our discharge sensor, that's our five bar 23C. And then you've got your little valves. So this is a recirc expansion valve, liquid cooled condenser expansion valve, shutoff valve, uh, cabin condenser right, cabin condenser left. And then this is the chiller valve. And then you've got your evaporator expansion valve um, control there. And uh, yeah, pretty cool. So let's just turn on the air conditioning and we'll see this system come up and start running. All right, compressor is now running. It gives us an RPM uh, that it's running at. I'm, you know, not asking a lot of the system. The uh, ambient temperature is around 61 degrees, and I'm requesting 60, 66. So let's crank it down to the very bottom. Start making it really cool, and you should see the compressor start to spin up higher, and you'll watch our pressure. So. This is pretty cool that we can actually look at this data and kind of, uh, we've got, we don't even have to hook up our gauges, right? Uh, to do an initial assessment on the refrigeration system. Uh, so if we go the other way, and you'll see that we're running now a liquid cooled condenser. And I don't know if I mentioned this, but up in the, um, that screen that we saw earlier, let's go back to our uh, presentation deck here. Um, up in the front, all we have is a radiator out, out front. We no longer have an, an air uh, exchange condenser. The only condenser is this liquid cooled condenser that's right there, okay? And uh, go back in the car here, John. All right. So you can see we're running through the liquid cooled condenser, but not the chiller. So you can see these valves are shut off. The chiller EXV is shut off. 
so we can actually go in there ok and i'm going to go up to the high end we're going to make some heat now and you'll see now what happens we take our condenser out of the loop we now have a chiller but our new condenser is actually inside the car inside the cabin here and that's where we are going to reject heat um, to warm that cabin air so pretty cool stuff um, you can look again watch your your pressures and so on so if if you own a one of these Teslas or get access to one of these, um, you may want to, I would encourage you to explore, uh, especially when you go to a supercharger, um, you know, do your supercharging and watch some of these temperatures and pressures and, and watch what's happening. You know, we go back to that, we'll go to the coolant panel here. And this is our coolant panel. We can see the mode that it's in right now. We're not running any coolant through the radiator right now. We're going through the chiller, so we're in the series bypass, or radiator bypass mode. And um, we can see our pump speeds. We can see our powertrain loop inlet, battery loop inlet temperatures, and then we can see the temperatures of the autopilot computer, which this is just like a big gaming computer. It's got a coolant loop that goes through it to maintain those temperatures. It is now getting pretty hot in here, so I'm gonna turn this, turn this down. And one thing you'll note, I'm going to actually just turn this AC off. One thing you'll note here down to the lower left, the rear drive inverter, you see we don't have any data there, and that's because the drive rails are off. If I press on the brake pedal here, it's going to turn on the rear drive inverter and the front drive inverter, and now we can get some data out of the vehicle. All right. Um, all right, so let's see. The last thing is the HVAC. So you can now look at some of the parameters inside the vehicle. Duct temperatures, uh, it defaults to give you that top view, so we can go to the left view, showing us the blower motor. We'll just turn our AC back on. Blower motor speed, the floor duct, the panel duct temperature, and also the bleed actuator. And then we can go to the right side and look at the upper actuator, bleed actuator, duct temperature, and so on. So we'll turn that back off. All right, so that's the end of the HVAC. Uh, the next one here is the chassis. And do we have any questions that uh, uh, came in? Yeah, Danny wants to know if you can change the settings to PSI and Fahrenheit, for example. Can we change them, oh, to from bar? Uh, not that I'm aware of. So sooner or later, you'll get adopted into the uh, metric system. So start learning the metric system. That's what I would uh, uh, do. Um, so, all right, and we do have we do have one that came into the, okay, that came into the uh, into the Q and A. All right, so somebody was paying attention. Um, I do see. Do you need toolbox to open the chiller system or coolant system per, to perform service, evacuate and recharge? So you do not need the toolbox application. You you can do it here, which I just demonstrated right on the basic service mode that we got in for for free. Okay, so. We're now here on the, the chassis tab here, and you've got a couple of, or four items here, uh, alignment and tires. So what's cool here is that it's looking at a long-term trend of, uh, of input on the electronic power steering control module or electric power assist control module to identify what kind, if there's alignment error. Usually you wanna see somewhere below uh, a half a degree in my opinion. Uh, I've seen them all over the place. But uh, see, we don't have any data there. So as soon as you touch the brake, sometimes you gotta move the wheel around just a little bit and then you can get that to update. You can see that we're at 0.3. We bought this car brand new three months ago and uh, after driving it uh, a couple hundred miles, I checked that applied offset. And this is after driving it down, down a long stretch of road. It was at 1.4. So um, again, I knew an alignment was needed. And indeed, we put it on the alignment rack and dialed it in. And so if you're doing alignments, I would encourage you to look into doing the Tesla alignments, doing them properly. The Model 3 and Y require ballasted. So you're going to put 150 pounds in each of the front seats. And then you're going to measure the right height of the vehicle and move the seats fore and aft to get the right heights correct. And then you're going to go through and do the, uh, do the alignment. You'll get the best results with that. Um, 
And additionally, we've ha had some of the threes and Ys and even the, uh, uh, on the rear of the S's where um, the alignment, the camber was too, too far negative. And we had to get some aftermarket components. We get those through, uh, our vendor we're using is um, Unplugged Performance out in Los Angeles, which actually is right next door to SpaceX and the Tesla Design uh, Center out there. So pretty cool stuff. So here's where you would do, uh, you could clear the applied offset after you do your alignment and you're gonna take it out for a drive. And then we also have what's called an offset drive test. And this will allow you to actually run through a mode and it will prompt you to drive the car straight down the road for a period of time and it'll do a quick assessment of the offset. I believe Tesla has this in place just to kind of run a, a preliminary check before they, before the technician is actually allowed to put it on the alignment rack. If it gets a pass, I don't believe they will do an alignment. They'll, they'll just say everything's good. Um, so just, uh, you know, use that um, knowledge as you can. And then down below that, you have the tire uh, reset. So this is a reset after reset the tire estimates. So tire wear estimates. Um, and then also whenever you do a rotation, you're going to go in here and um, set that up. And also whenever you change tires, of course, uh, you're going to basically want to set the different types if you're changing from a winter to a summer. Um, and that's done in another panel. Um, but this will let you do a relearn on that. Uh, all right. Uh, we do have a steering panel. Um, this is steering wheel control module. Uh, so you can kind of check all your different buttons. You can see the little, there some of the buttons there. I'm on the left wheel here. I'm pressing down on it. I'm going to press on the right wheel. Um, see the park lever. I'm pushing in the park button. So, so again, some diagnostic panels that you can use. And then here's our brake uh, tab. And you can see there's some information here. Uh, turn our AC off again here. Uh, we've got a brake stiffness check. And I'm going to go ahead and just run this. And this has what's called the eye booster, and that's the Bosch eye booster. And it's basically going to run through, and it's going to check to see um, if the pressures are correct and if there's any bleed-off leakage. So imagine if you had, you suspected you had air in the system, I would run this test first and just let it run its, its deal. Now, I don't have a camera here, but I can see the brake pedal now being exercised. And it's going to do a series of tests and it's going to give us a test report here in just a second okay and there we go so it did pass um, it says that the measured stiffness is 63 bar the minimum is 36 and the max is 80. leakage check passed and it says we have a 22.1 bar and the maximum is four okay and then um, below that is all the actual raw data well test results okay so good good info and then also whenever you're bleeding you know you're still going to need to change brake fluid um, on these vehicles so you've got a brake bleed procedure that'll help you with uh, there's your electric parking brake service mode so you can do the brake service um, on a on the rear and then you've got your brake burnishing tab and then down here we've got closures so all the windows you can look and see um, calibration on the different windows if you're changing out a window motor or doing any adjustments on the doors or what have you um, you're going to want to run the calibration again because it's doing the the pinch test uh, pinch resistance so that you know if somebody's got their finger in there it's going to back off properly so you want to set all those up so that you can um, perform that properly and then down below that we've got the airbags and so you can look at airbag information it's giving us a little hint Tap on components to view. So I just hit the brake again. You see that these things, these systems are now being activated so we can see what's going on. So everything looks good there. And then there's some seat uh, information uh, and so on. So that's, that's uh, pretty much it for this service mode. Um, I wanted to just touch on one more thing here um, back on our deck here. So this is a short little recording um, whenever you're going to a supercharger, uh, you need to make sure that the car is navigating to that supercharger so it knows that it's, it's going to be supercharged because there's preconditioning that's going to take place. I've got a short little clip here that I'm going to play, and you're going to hear some audio because one of the ways that um, it, it, it 
can scavenge heat or create heat for the coolant loop to heat that battery up is that it can do uh, what they call lossy control. And this, this uh, verbiage came from uh, the professor at Weber State University up in uh, Utah, John Kelly. And uh, he's got an awesome video about the, the entire um, heat pump system. Uh, so I encourage you to go check that out on, on YouTube. Um, the, if you look over here, I've got another, I've got a can tap on my vehicle to grab two can channels. And you'll see that the front motor, which is actually an induction motor, is basically being used to create heat. And so what it's going to do is going to basically just, just basically try to lock that rotor and that, that induction rotor. And as we're driving, the rotor is spinning through those magnetic fields and you're gonna hear this whining. And you may hear the whining on the outside of the car, but uh, customers may complain uh, to you about that. But th what's going on there is that it's scavenging heat. It's creating heat and transferring it into the coolant. And you'll see that when we're accelerating here, we're, we're, we're using the rear traction motor for propulsion on the vehicle. Okay, and you can see some torque numbers down here. Um, and I'm just gonna play this video and you wanna listen. You hear the whining. You can see the front motor, it says 188 foot-pounds, but it's not really being used to propel the vehicle. And this other panel I just showed that popped up, that's, that has some, some of that flow and temperatures. But pretty cool, uh, pretty cool stuff. All right, so next we're going to go into Toolbox, and we're going to talk about that for just a second. In the Toolbox app, that is a required, or that's a purchase. Um, and I, I remember when we got access to this about two years ago, I, I got it right away and I wanted to explore. And, um, and they, again, Tesla has really started to add a lot more uh, features into this product here so that we could actually perform uh, more operations. And we can now do remote stuff. So I wanted to kind of show you what that's all about. But before we do that, I'm going to just connect Toolbox to the car, and I'm going to show you what happens to the panels inside the vehicle for the uh, what you get with Toolbox. So over here on the left, um, or on my this is I'm already logged into my account, and I'm going to click on this vehicle connection um, here, and right down here I'm just going to click on connect. All right, and we are connected. So very, very quick connection. Some of the earlier cars may be a little slower to connect. And, um, and you, you also need to make sure if you're, if you're using a, uh, you know, you're using an RJ45 Ethernet port on your computer to connect, you need to watch those activity lights. If they're not lit up, sometimes you got to get in the car and actually press on the brake, you may need to put it into drive and then put it into park and uh, put that, Wake, wake that system up and then go make your connection. But this, this is a later model car, hardware four car, very, very quick to connect. So uh, let's go back into the car here, John. And we now see down at the bottom right, we have can viewer, okay? And you can see at the top of the screen, it says uh, uh, service mode plus. And you can see some of the signals that I've got up here. Um, uh, already selected. So I can clear all those out. This is the bus. This is the Ethernet bus. And then we're, we're going to reach into these other modules and take a look at some of the data here. Um, EPAS angle calibration, apply it offset. So there we've got our, our 0.5 degrees there. Um, we can add all those. You can see the steering, the torque on the steering wheel as, as well. All right. But that's, that's kind of boring because if we go back here to our panel, if we go into the low voltage here, we now have an option that says CAN bus, okay? Gives us a warning, says the CAN bus diagnostic panel is in beta. Uh, but now here we're looking at the party bus in the center selected there, how many errors are being seen and all the modules and uh, whether they're online or not, okay? We go to the vehicle bus here on the left and then we can also look at the chassis bus as well. Um, so, uh, so this might help you with uh, doing some diagnostics on the vehicle. Maybe you've got a harness that you're
chasing down and you want to start wiggling harnesses um, and having somebody monitor this uh, and so on. Um, yeah, uh, so that is, uh, that's, that's what we've got there. So I'm going to basically exit service mode now. I mean, I'm going to demonstrate what you can do without actually being connected to the car. So say that you've got a client that uh, calls you and you want to, um, you want to basically access their car remotely. You're going to come to this uh, owner authorization request page here after you log into Toolbox and you're going to request owner authorization and you have to enter their email. You have to have the VIN and then you're going to give it a reason. You're going to ensure you're not a robot and then you're going to send that, send that out. I have two cars currently that um, I've got access to. Uh, they expire after, I believe, a week and seven days. Um, and so I've got these two cars that I have access to. And the first thing I want to do is go to garage, okay? And I already had this vehicle selected. So it's trying to connect to this car, and this is mine. This is the one that's sitting next to us. But it's, it's reaching out to Tesla servers and then back into the car and pulling some data up, okay? And one of the things that it's pulling up here is uh, we've got the VIN, we've got when it was the build date, uh, the mileage, and then um, I want to pay, uh, bring your attention to these three items right here. See where it says HVAC rail is on, which you usually see that on all the time, and, but the accessory rail is off and the drive rail is off. And the reason this is important is if you wanted to get some of the other data parameters you will see that are missing down here, you may need to work with the client and, and at the time you're accessing this, have them on the brake pedal and have the, all the rails up and powered up, okay? Um, and we'll get down to that data here in just a second. Second thing to be aware of, and I just had an inquiry from a customer recently trying to figure out why he, he has uh, some, some problems with... Uh, with the vehicle. Um, we looked in here and I saw it said supercharging access here and it said not allowed. All right. And that was a red flag for me. And, um, you know, after a series of questioning with the customer, I found out this car was actually a salvage title vehicle. And when they are salvage title, Tesla takes them off the supercharging access until they go through a, um, a certification inspection and uh, then they, they may put it back on uh, available. So good information to be aware of. Um, so if we come down here and we talked earlier about this uh, electronic power assisted steering. Uh, so we have both the primary and secondary modules where we're looking for that angle offset to determine if maybe there might be a problem with the alignment. We don't have any data there, right? So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna put a brake, uh, brake pedal depressor on the car wake that stuff up and then I'm going to come over here I'm going to click on can Explorer and I'm going to go back to garage and it's going to refresh data from the vehicle and we come down here and we see now all the rails are on okay and so now when we come down to our power steering data we can now see those data values, okay? All right. Uh, also, you can see all the different camera calibration, um, the, the progress and the actual current pitches, pitch angles, and so on. Uh, a lot of high voltage stuff, infotainment stuff, and just tons of information that you can get remotely. Um, and then a lot of these service fix uh, alerts here to take a look at. And if you click on one of these, it's gonna take you into the toolbox service information and we can click through and start reading about these uh, articles. Uh, so lots of, lots of good data here. So we're going to quickly, I know we're getting towards the end of this, but I wanted to show one more thing here. Over here we have what's called Can Explorer. Okay. And Can Explorer is uh, pretty cool and I don't, I have to have a VIN up here and that is this VIN right here. So as soon as I put that VIN in, it's going to look at it by default. It pulls up the last two weeks and it's showing what logs are available. 
And you can see that on the left side, a manual pull, I actually requested logs uh, prior to this, this event. You can hit request logs to get all the latest data. And then it may take 30 minutes or so to get that information. But uh, you can see that we do have some data here available. If we go over to the left here where it says alerts, we can actually see all the warnings, warning alerts, okay? You can see how many times that alert has set, 12 times there. We have links to articles, so you can do some uh, research on it, um, and so on. Also, emergency speaker fail there, um, collision warning event. So if I was to click on this, which I just did, it's going to basically load up a panel down here and pull in a, a bunch of alerts, alert data payload to help us gain a little more perspective as to what uh, what was happening with this vehicle. OK. So we can mouse over each of these and get uh, some info about when the alert cleared. And so this is showing us only when it cleared. It doesn't show us when it actually set, but it gives us some information, uh, some data that might be useful for us to analyze the problem further. And you can continue to add more and more, right? So I, I'm clicking on that one down there. Uh, let's see, watchdog reset. We'll let it load up. Uh, the next thing over here, and this probably deserves a deeper uh, session to kind of go into exactly what you can do here. But now we have signals, okay? And so say that we wanted to look at a specific signal, we can search for one. I'm just going to type in speed since that should be um, should be pretty easy. So uh, say that say we had an ABS question or something, we want to pull up all the wheel speed sensors in history. So I'm going to click on that first one there. It's going to load it up into a panel, and you'll see right there it's loading. But say I wanted to put all four of these on this same panel. So the front front left, I got the front right. So if I click on this, it's going to actually add a second panel below this. But if I want to just click and drag it over. I have options. I can put it on the stack it on the top, stack it on the bottom, or I can put it on the right axis. So I'm going to basically put the left on the left axis, the right, all the rights on the right axis. Okay, and those are going to continue to load up. And in just a second, we're going to have all that data available to us. So we have now the front right. We have the rear. Okay, and we have them all. All right. So we have them all. Um, we can scrub across here. You see, we have a lot of data, so we can go ahead and kind of zoom in, click and drag, click and drag again. Whoops, there we go. Click and drag, and click and drag. Of course, this car doesn't have any problems, but here we can we can go through and look at a log in history, and uh, we can reference it with some time. Uh, perhaps when the customer was having some sort of problem or maybe when there was another event or something uh, taking place. Um, you, can, you can actually uh, take, grab a PNG so you can download an image of this. Over here on the top, you can actually download all the plots at once. And it's basically just going to download that. And then you can also just download all the CSV data. So you want to get all the, all the data in a raw CSV file. Um, you can click download. It gives it a file name with the VIN number and all the, the time and date stamp and let it download. Okay. All right. So um, let's go back to our presentation deck there, Johnny. And uh, so as you can see, there's some pretty powerful features here. We didn't go through all of them. Uh, a lot of really cool stuff. And so do we have any questions that have uh, really popped up that we need to address here, Johnny? Yeah, Brandon wants to know if access to the garage and service mode plus are free or do they require a subscription? No, that is a subscription. So you can get a short term subscription or, a, or an annual subscription for that. And I, I believe the annual now is $3,000. It was 2000 when I first got into it, but you also had to buy service information at that time. And since then, they have made the service info free and raised the price of uh, the toolbox application. But in most cases, all you need is a RJ45 Ethernet cable. There are some earlier cars where you need a special adapter. And there's one special group of uh, vehicles where you need to have this media access controller. Uh, very expensive uh, interface device, but it's only a very small range of uh, vehicles to get access to it. Okay. 
Um, all right, so uh, any other questions? Yeah, Carla wants to know if accessing malfunction codes is only available via the toolbox or can you see that in service mode? You can see this, the malfunction codes in service mode. Uh, so on the very first page that you go into, you got service alerts. You can go through and look at what those alerts are and, uh, and pull those up. But in order, for, in order to do anything remotely that we just talked about here, you have to have the paid uh, subscription uh, to Tesla. And you can, again, you can get a short term if you want to just play with it. But um, it, it will require a lot of time, right? You're going to need to figure out what, what's normal, what's not normal. This is really the point of this, uh, this video here is to help us get familiar with these systems because we need to learn what's normal and what to expect uh, when we get challenged with a, uh, with a problem, okay? All right, uh, so there are a couple of resources here I want to share with you. Um, we've got Weber State, uh, Professor John Kelly, I mentioned that earlier. They have a training program, it's a non-credit system. Uh, they've got some online training uh, that are prerequisites for a week-long hands-on training and certification system. Uh, we have Earthling Auto up in uh, San Francisco. Um, that's Carolyn Kokolet's uh, business up there and uh, Jack Rosebro is now doing uh, training in their old shop since they moved to a new shop. Uh, Eurotech up in Minnesota, we've got Seth Thorson. Uh, he is uh, doing a lot of training on the Tesla stuff and uh, doing some really good exploration. And of course, we've got uh, the Diagnostic Network. So I encourage you to add those to your list of items. And uh, if we have any further questions, uh, we can throw them in the, in the chat. Otherwise, we've got about two minutes. And I wanna thank you for attending this. And uh, please give me some feedback on this. I need to know what worked, what didn't work for you, um, whether the presentation was worthwhile, um, because I wanna, I wanna try to do some more of this kind of work. Uh, there's a lot to explore here on, on this particular car. And then of course, we've got other stuff that we can explore and share knowledge and information on too. So um, any other questions there, Johnny, coming in? Yeah, Brandon also wants to know if uh, he wanted to know how you set up the screen recording on the vehicle. <laughs> uh, I have a special, um, I had my monitor uh, modified. And uh, is, I basically, actually what I did, I found a guy online. Um, he's back east. And this is the second one of these monitors. So I have the original, mo the center stack, center screen. I, I just ordered a special one from him that he's modified and put an uh, HDMI out on. Uh, but in order to get that HDMI out, I have to go to, to a special converter box because it's an odd uh, ratio, uh, odd dimensions, and a lot of the, the uh, uh, screen re recognition devices don't always pull that up. So I uh, hope that answered your question. Uh, anything else? No other questions. Okay, well, there will be also in the chat, if you need a certificate of attendance, please put something in the chat saying, hey, I'd like a certificate. I will email you a certificate uh, um, sometime in the near future, next couple days or so. Um, but uh, otherwise, thanks for everything, and uh, we'll see you on the other side.